Hello, it's Bruce Williams, and it's time for part one of my series on selected gross pathology of the rabbit. It's not going to be a lot of pathology in this particular lecture. We're going to talk a little bit about breeds and some anatomic peculiarities of this species, which will help us understand some of the diseases that they get. As I do at the beginning of all of my lectures, I want to thank my colleagues and friends who have provided me images over the years, either directly or indirectly through online collections, and especially recognize my friend Dean Percy, who has shared his knowledge with all of us in his book, The Pathology of Laboratory Rodents and Rabbits, as well as sharing his images to so many of us over the years. Well, let's start with a couple of species of rabbits that we probably should be familiar with, and maybe some breeds as well. This is Oryctolagus cunicula, the European rabbit, which is a progenitor type for today's laboratory rabbit. It looks very much like the North American cottontail, which we all see in our front yards in North America. Um, but they're two very different species, not even belonging to the same genus. The cottontail is, a, is comprised of about 20 different species of Silvalagus, Silvalagus audubonii being one of the more common. There are a number of uh, skeletal differences between the two. Going back to the European rabbit, it was primarily seen in, it's a native of southwestern Europe and North Africa. Its range has either contracted in some areas due to some devastating diseases such as myxomatosis and rabbit clesivirus, and it's expanded in some areas as it's in, been introduced as an invasive species in a number of countries, most notably in Australia. This much larger and wise looking creature is the European brown hare. It ranges throughout Europe into Asia and it's one of the largest of logomorphs. It's an extremely fast runner and its eyes are set up on top of its head. It has long ears and a long flexible, flexible neck and has been known to hit up to 70 miles an hour in short bursts. Unless, unlike the European uh, rabbit, it does not burrow. European rabbits live in large underground burrows uh, called warrens. The, uh, the hare tends to live in much more open country with scattered brush and during the day will live in shallow uh, burrows or shallow pits which is dug called forms. They tend to stay out of the way until nighttime. They are shy and nocturnal, but sometimes you will see them during the day, and they often will get up on their back legs and box at each other. And you think that these are uh, two males fighting, but it's often a female uh, trying to let a male know that she is not quite yet ready for mating. And this type of behavior has given rise to the English idiom to be mad as a March hare, because March is a time of breeding for the European brown hare. And here's today's laboratory rabbit, the New Zealand white. Um, even though the, the name suggests it comes from the, uh, the Eastern Hemisphere, uh, New Zealand whites are actually American in origin and the breed originated in California, possibly from rabbits imported from New Zealand. They're not always white, they also come in red, black, blue, and a broken or a goody type color, with this, which is other colors mixed with white. They weren't originally bred for laboratories or even the pet trade. They were originally bred for their fur and meat, um, as many of the rabbit breeds are. They average about 10 to 12 pounds, with the does being slightly larger than the, than the bucks. They are relatively docile. They have long legs, short uh, front legs with strong pectoral muscles. And because they react um, very similarly to humans in a number of diseases, they have been adapted well for the laboratory life. Laboratory New Zealand whites are albinos. The term lop rabbit or lop-eared rabbit is given to any rabbits with ears that droop. And there are about 20 different uh, recognized breeds of lop-eared rabbits. The ears for rabbit, because a rabbit can't sweat, are considered the thermoregulatory organ. 
and so longer ears have traditionally been associated with rabbits that come from warmer climates. There are a number of ways that rabbits carry their ears. Um, you can have erect ears which stick up as we've seen before. There are full lops where both ears hang fully down, half lops or lops where they're sort of uh, uh, parallel to the ground and something called horn lops in which the ears face forward and come down slightly like the horns of a cow. This would be a full lop animal and they don't always uh, achieve their full droop until the adult size in some of these breeds. Here's a Himalayan dwarf rabbit. And dwarf rabbits have some of their own diseases. They are interesting. They're much smaller than European rabbits, but they may interbreed freely with them. This one is actually a Jersey woolly. Um, and don't confuse dwarf rabbits with wild pygmy rabbits. Pygmy uh, rabbits live in nature, usually in the hollowed logs or, or something like that, and a very different species. So these are dwarf rabbits, and we're going to talk a little bit about dwarf rabbits in the lecture on the nervous system. This striking rabbit is known as the Dutch rabbit or the Hollander breed. Some people call these the Dutch belted rabbit, but that really name doesn't exist. There's a Dutch belted cow, which has very similar markings, but it's called a Dutch rabbit. And uh, this breed was uh, used to be one of the most popular pet breeds. It's suffered in, in recent years, but still in the top 10. Um, the small size and its easygoing nature made it very popular, but when dwarf rabbits, as we just looked at, came in, it sort of pushed the uh, Dutch rabbit out of the top spot. Like so many of these breeds, it, the name is a bit of a misnomer because this particular type of rabbit was developed in England. Not all of the Dutch rabbits are, uh, are black and white, although that's the most common. They also can have the white markings mixed with blue or chocolate or uh, steel, or the whole thing can be a little bit mixed up in the tortoiseshell breeds of the Dutch rabbit. They're also characterized by a, a blaze or an even wedge of white fur, which starts in the cheeks and runs up over to the top of the head. This breed is an Angora, and I hope that I've taken a picture of it facing forward, but I'm not quite sure. Um, Angoras are a very old breed of rabbit. The name is derived from uh, the classic term for Ankara, Turkey where they are uh, reputed to have developed as many as 10 centuries ago. They're of course bred for the fine fibers of their coat. Rabbit fur is considered to be hypoallergenic and these animals can be plucked or combed on a regular basis to collect the fur um, without requiring pelting or slaughtering. They knew, do need to be plucked or combed a minimum of every six months um, or else the fur gets all matted and very difficult to work with. As you can imagine with such a coat and the animals need to groom itself, this particular breed is especially prone to development of trichobezoars, also known as wool block, and has a higher than uh, normal frequency of various mites including Kylatiella. Okay, this is not a lop rabbit. This is a special type of New Zealand white rabbit known as the Watanabe rabbit. It's an inbrain strain, uh, strain of rabbit which was one of the earliest models for atherosclerosis due to a single gene mutation for the LDL receptors on the surface of hepatocytes. These animals exhibit progressively increasing levels of hypercholesterolemia, elevated plasma, low density lipoproteins, and severe atherosclerosis with the deposition of fat uh, in organs throughout the body. The reason that this animal's ears are down is because of the accumulation of fat within these particular tissues. 
The Watanabe rabbit's not used as much today as it used to be with the advent of a number of transgenic models uh, of mice, which are, are a, while initially more expensive, uh, cheaper to keep in the long run, but you can still buy rabbits from the Watanabe Foundation for research. I believe Dr. Watanabe passed away a number of years ago, but this particular strain still, and the institute he founded, still bears his name. We're going to talk more about the Watanabe rabbit in the third lecture where we cover the cardiovascular system. Okay, a little bit about uh, the reproduction of rabbits. A doe or a female rabbit uh, becomes fertile between 8 to 12 weeks of age and can safely bred at around 17 to 18 weeks of age. You don't want to breed them before this age because you can have problems with a doe and the kids. Uh, does are fertile all year long um, with some vi minor variation um, with, in response to the day length. The gestation period for most uh, species and breeds of rabbit is between 28 to 35 days with most of the animals giving birth or kindling at 31 through 32 days. The doe will pull fur from her abdomen to make a nest and the kits are kindled into this fur nest where they're going to live for three weeks. Rabbits are not good mothers. They're not the worst in the world, but they're certainly not the best. And they do, uh, they do nurse their, uh, their young only once a day. And they will kill kits from other does. We will mention uh, uh, cannibalism uh, here. It is, uh, it is uncommon in rabbits, but it can happen in the wild. It's considered to uh, a defensive mechanism to avoid detection by predators. Um, but it can also be, be on by a severe lack of food or uh, available water. The bucks generally don't do much in terms of raising the young, although in a colony situation, they may act as babysitters and a heat source for young kits. Um, they do not uh, kill and eat kits under normal circumstances. Remember that rabbits uh, are induced ovulators, and a doe can get pregnant within 24 hours after giving birth. The kits are generally born blind and hairless, and the fur begins to grow between three to five days, and their eyes will open by two weeks. The GI tract of rabbits is, is fairly amazing. Um, here is the stomach with the attached spleen, small intestine, and this large organ here is the cecum, which holds about 40 to 45 percent of ingesta at any given time. Um, this large cecum is very characteristic of hindgut fermenters, such as rabbits and guinea pigs. Um, who both have similar mechanisms, which we'll talk about in a minute. The front part of the cecum has a, uh, an antrum, which is known as the sacculus rotundus. It is a large lymphoid organ, like a cecal tonsil. It sits at the front of the, uh, of the cecum. The rabbit also has a very long appendix, even longer than people. And it's essentially a large lymphoid organ as well. We'll look at some, some diseases later on of hot gram-negative organisms which attack the, uh, uh, the white or the lymphoid tissue in these organs and really will show you the extent of a lymphoid organ. But if you cut through this appendix, it's very easy to mistake it for the ileum, which is also heavily invested with lymphoid tissue. The other things to uh, know is that the entire length of duodenum has Brunner's glands as opposed to uh, just the anterior part in most other mammals. Okay, cecotrophy or cecotrophs and feces on 
this side of the paper towel are the normal round feces, which are the feces that are passed by the rabbit during most of the day. Because the majority of the uh, B vitamins and protein is produced in the cecum, which comes after the absorptive part of the small intestine, the rabbits and many other rodents, the hindgut fermenters, have developed a unique system to be able to recycle and use those B vitamins and protein, which is produced far down in the GI tract, and that is through the ingestion of a certain type of feces called cecotrophs, which are high in these vitamins. Okay, the cecotrophs are generally passed at night when the animals are not stressed and they are ingested. They're larger than, and softer in nature than the normal feces. Cecotrophy is controlled by the adrenal glands, so if the animals are stressed, this practice may disappear and the animals will suffer from malnutrition. Here's actually a disease, but I'm going to show it to you again when we get to the urinary tract. I'm going to mention a, a very unique adaptation by rodents, which is really not uh, repeated in the mammalian kingdom. Most mammals, including people, excrete most of your calcium and most of your magnesium in the bile. Rabbits excrete up to 60% of it in the urine. And so they have urine, which often has a lot of crystals. This is way too much. This is probably an obstructed rabbit. But the normal urine of rabbits is very cloudy because of the large amount of calcium carbonate crystals contained within. And then when the animal has trouble urinating, you tend to get this large amount of sludge buildup. But just remember that rabbit urine is very cloudy due to, to calcium. Horse urine is fairly cloudy too, but that's because they have a lot of mucus in it. They have mucus glands in the renal pelvis, which is a unique feature for horses. And that's why if you watch horses urinate, um, initially it'll be clear and then the last bit will be very cloudy. Doesn't mean that they have a urinary tract infection, nor should rabbits be interpreted because their urine is cloudy to have any source of infections, just because they normally excrete a lot of calcium in the bile. They have some other abnormalities of, of calcium metabolism, which we'll talk about in a later lecture. This slide is to remind me these are neutrophils in a rabbit. Here's a neutrophil, here's an eosinophil. And early on, because of the difficulties in identifying both of them, they have a very similar type of, of uh, heterophilic granule. Um, they were lumped into the same category as heterophils, and you'll see that, uh, that name used uh, often in the uh, literature describing rabbit diseases as referring to either a neutrophil or an eosinophil. Uh, I'm about six of one and a half a dozen on uh, this one. I don't mind whether people call them neutrophils or heterophils if they can actually tell the difference, but you'll see the term heterophils. Do you know that rabbits have really two uteruses? The horns are separated, and they both have their own cervix. Ah, uh, here's a little bit of histo. Um, but if you are looking uh, at the testis, you will note that the terminal portion of the vas deferens looks like nothing else uh, in the rabbit. And it's very large and it's very prominent in rabbits. And in longitudinal section, it has all of these glands with an elongated sort of honeycomb appearance. So um, if you see that mystery bit of tissue and you're not, you're not sure whether it's uh, intestine and you're pretty sure that this is not uterus because it's not a female rabbit, you're probably looking at the terminal portion of the vas. And, and the vas and the epididymis and a number of species can look a little strange. Um, there are differences within the head of the histologic differences generally within the head, the middle, and the caudal ports of the epididymis in most of our laboratory species that if you're doing a lot of work with them, you probably should become familiar with. And to close this introductory lecture, 
Uh, rodents are lagomorphs, and there are very few other lagomorphs, including uh, pikas, which are sort of like alpine rabbits, which live in Europe. And I think they're the only lagomorphs uh, out there. And the reason that they are considered lagomorphs and not uh, rodents are the presence of these peg teeth, which sit behind the incisors. The incisors will fit uh, uh, right up here in this groove, but you have these extra peg teeth, and that's what makes the rabbit the lagomorph instead of a rodent. Okay, well that concludes this introductory lecture on the pathology of, lab, of laboratory rabbits. We're going to start our next lecture on the respiratory diseases of rabbits, which is a very, very important system in rabbit pathology. Thanks for listening, and I hope you have a great day.